Predicting the future is risky business. Elected officials, city planners, and citizens are faced with difficult planning decisions concerning Seattle and the Puget Sound region. A complex computer system called Urban Sim has been designed as a planning tool to help understand the impact of alternative plans. What would happen over periods of 20 or 30 years? So we're interested in the long term, uh, not just the short term. What will things be like in 2007, you know, a long time from now? How will people get around? Where will houses be? Where will jobs be? Will there be traffic jams? Who knows? Capstone projects, uh, you'll draw on different parts of the CS curriculum. So some of them are graphics oriented. There's some software engineering ones, programming languages, um, parallel programming, and so forth. The emphasis is on the development process so that you learn about real world trade-offs in doing engineering projects. Uh, in this case, a, a very interdisciplinary project with some real world applications. And we're interested in how environmental effects come out of this and how land use and transportation interacts. So, so in particular, if we uh, build a new freeway or a new rail system, that will serve a certain number of current people, but in the longer term, change the patterns of land use. You can already see that, for example, in Rainier Valley, where there's a lot of construction going on of condos and stuff along the light rail line, even though it isn't open, but it, just in anticipation of it, because that will be a uh, pretty valuable property. And so it tends to get more compact development, and then you know, people can walk from the condo to the rail line. Urban Sim simulates the growth of urban areas by creating alternative scenarios concerning urban land use and transportation. People can interact with these simulations through the use of a computer. This quarter in Paul's class, the main goal, in fact, is modeling Alaska Way viaduct alternatives. You know, so what if we uh, rebuilt it, put it in a tunnel, or uh, got rid of it, uh, the surface and transit option? What would the long-term implications be for land use? The Urban Sim Capstone is a hands-on learning tool. Students are introduced to the design, development, and use of operational urban simulation models for the evaluation of land use, transportation, and environmental policies. I think that should be fine because they all have to be done before yeah. it moves on to the next step, uh -huh. and waiting doesn't take that much extra time. It's just like the goal of the parallel programming group is to investigate running like urban sim. We finished um, paralyzing the models and um, we're trying to verify if our results is um, the same as the um, non-paralyzed model. A lot of computers have more than one core, like but the urban sim currently only runs on one core at a time. We could speed it up by making it run on multiple cores. So we've kind of made progress in the Thomas Edison sense, in which he tested like 800 different filaments and found that they didn't work, which narrows you know, the choices down. And uh, it's important that it be fast and correct, as opposed to just fast. We did find something that worked eventually. In the hallway of the Urban Sim Lab, you will see a traffic light. If the light is green, the system has passed all its test. But if the light is red, it means that a test has failed. And if it's yellow, the system is in the middle of running tests. This lets the people working on Urban Sim see whether things are functioning or if there is a problem. I mean, I the Build System Group worked on replacing software okay. that helps keep track um, of changes to the system. The software automatically runs a set of tests whenever there is a change. The Build System Group also worked on hooking up their new software to the traffic light. So that the results of the test are shown. What we are doing here right now is only providing a tool to monitor uh, the, uh, the status of the project. The input data to the Urban Sim project, taken for example from tax collector data, that data sometimes has errors in it and what we're trying to do is detect the errors. The goal is to use machine learning techniques that have been developed in artificial intelligence research. Um, for instance, you have a building and the square feet that you have, the number of floors that are there, that kind of a thing, and figuring out whether or not the number of floors matches up with the total square feet. So the machine will go through and learn all these numbers and then decide if certain rows don't make any sense, certain values don't make any sense. We're um, basically trying out this, this new package, VFML, that stands for Very Fast Machine Learning, and we're trying to figure out how to use that in order to accomplish what our entire project is. Examples. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly why it does what it does, or what it does, but uh, it does it. The parcel subdivision project goal is to simulate the way a parcel of land can be divided into individual lots for future neighborhoods. And then a major problem with dealing with the polygons, like as you've seen it, particularly 
the, the two models that we're dealing, the cul-de-sac and traditional mm -hmm. grid, the two different algorithms is concavity in polygons yeah. is makes it really hard to deal with. You know, do, do grids in this shape make sense from a planning perspective? The, the way the developers want to do it is because they, first of all, they look at them. first and foremost what the donate is going to be. Indicators for equity analysis is a tool for looking at how planning decisions affect different groups. For instance, what would happen if you extended light rail into a new community? Equity indicators could be used to look at such things as the changes in land value around the light rail line or in neighborhood composition, and more generally, whether the cost and benefits of a project are distributed equitably. Right now in this first phase of our project, trying to display a different way of interpreting them with a Lorenz curve. The Lorenz curve is, uh, is sort of like you have a list of something like average household income and you want to plot that on a graph which shows um, how much of the people have what percent of the pie. But anyway, there's the all close uh, function that we were talking about. So that's what that's the guy you want to use and you can feed it a tolerance. And so the next step would be to do this on something that's coming from the Opus cache, the, the urban, urban simulation run. So household income would be, you know, not totally interesting, but as Joel said, but would be a you know really nice transitional step that would be uh, really simple to do, it would exercise the, the tool you've already created. It would lead to um, a useful outcome. And I think getting our hands kind of into the folding will help us with the next thing that we do. You know, you'd have, uh, you know, here's a solid thing and, and then, you know, you can refine it and see how modelers use it. Here we can kind of go a little bit slower and make sure that we do it right. And there's no sitting in lecture and, and trying to absorb information uh, that is just handed to you. You actually have to go out and uh, learn things yourself. We're actually taking programs that we write and integrating it with an existing framework, which is the Urban Sim Project.